Life is everywhere we look. It's in the skies, our own backyards, our rivers and streams, even in places that are impossible for us to survive in. With all these different kinds of life, it's hard to keep everything organized. That's why scientists have come up with taxonomy, the science of describing and classifying all organisms based on similar traits. Those traits start very broad, like what type of cell does the organism have? Is it prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Basically, does the organism's cells have membrane-bound organelles or not? This broad trait classifies organisms into three domains, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. After this, the traits start becoming more and more specific to the individual organism in question. We start at domain, then go to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and finally species. Just remember, did King Philip come over for grandma's soup? Today, we'll be talking about the kingdoms of life. There are currently six kingdoms, archaea, eubacteria, protista, fungi, plantae, and animalia. We'll start with archaea. Archaea are single-celled organisms in the domain of archaea. That's pretty easy to remember. They used to be known as archaeobacteria, but these organisms have distinct characteristics that distinguish them from bacteria. Many archaea species are known as extremophiles, meaning they live in extreme environments. Environments like the acidic, boiling, grand prismatic hot springs of Yellowstone National Park. Each of the different colors of green, orange, and yellow you see are different species of archaea. They also live in the sea vents at the bottom of the ocean, sea ice, and even very salty deserts. Archaea is derived from the Greek word archaeos, meaning ancient or primitive. Virtually all bacteria contain peptidoglycan in their cell walls. However, archaea and eukaryotes lack peptidoglycan. The lack of this polysaccharide is a distinguishing feature separating archaea from the bacteria. Eubacteria is the kingdom that is classified in the domain bacteria. Again, pretty easy. Just like archaea, bacteria are prokaryotic single-celled organisms. As mentioned before, they do differ from archaea in several ways. They are more commonly known as germs because they live practically everywhere on Earth. Some can be harmful, like the kind that causes strep throat, while others are rather beneficial for us. They perform essential roles in nature like decomposition. The bacteria in the soil help release locked away nutrients and organic matter to be taken up by plant life and revitalizing our soils. Without bacteria, we would probably be up to our eyeballs in dead plant and animal matter, including feces. There are even bacteria in your gut that help you digest plant matter. Both archaea and eubacteria organisms can be autotrophic, which means they can produce their own food through the processes like photosynthesis, or they can be heterotrophic, meaning they have to consume another organism in order to obtain their energy, like us. Those are the two kingdoms of life of the prokaryotic cell types. The rest have eukaryotic cells. So the four remaining kingdoms belong in the domain eukarya. Protista is a kingdom that is sometimes referred to as the catch-all kingdom. Since they are eukaryotic, but they don't resemble animals, plants, or fungi, they have their own kingdom. The term protista is derived from the Greek word protistos, meaning the very first. These organisms are usually in water or very moist environments. Just to show how diverse this kingdom can be, these organisms can be microscopic, very large, unicellular, or multicellular species. In fact, the giant kelp in the oceans is a protist, it's not a plant. Some can be autotrophic, while others are heterotrophic, with some being parasitic. Some have cell walls, 
They can reproduce asexually and sexually, and even both. Scientists often put these into categories of animal-like protists, like amoebas and radiozoa, plant-like protists, like red algae and diatoms, and fungi-like protists, like plasmodial slime molds. Take a breath. Now take a second breath. That second breath came from protists undergoing photosynthesis, many of them in the oceans. As diverse and unique as the protist kingdom is, as we go through the eukaryota domain, things take on a more familiar look. The fungi kingdom is one we see and use every day. From the mushrooms we get on our pizza, or growing in our yards, or the mold on old fruit or bread, these are just a fraction of the different kinds of fungi out there. Fungi are like protists. They can be unicellular or multicellular. They can reproduce sexually, asexually, or both. But this is where the similarities end. Fungi are heterotrophic, non-photosynthetic organisms that absorb their nutrients from their environment. They also secrete enzymes into their food, then absorb the digested material through their cell walls. Their cell walls are composed of chitin, a polymer that also makes up the exoskeletons of insects and crustaceans. There are many different types of fungus, ranging from the microscopic yeast that we use to make bread, to the single largest organism on the planet. A single fungi can occupy an area of over 800 hectares. There are many different kinds of fungus. There are the citrid funguses, which are the group of fungus that are causing such terrible losses to our frog species right now worldwide. The conjugated funguses that you see on your bread when you leave it out too long. The ascomycota, or sac fungi. These are the baking, brewing, and winemaking yeast. These are also the ones that cause athlete's foot and ringworm. And the club fungi, which you often see the reproductive organs in your yard after a rain often referred to as the gill fungi. The next kingdom is a kingdom full of eukaryotic, multicellular, autotrophic organisms. This kingdom is plantae. These photosynthetic organisms are the staple to terrestrial and most aquatic ecosystems. Unlike fungi cell walls, which were made of chitin, plant cell walls are composed of cellulose. Within those same plant cells, as well as the photosynthetic protists, there are specialized organelles in which the magic of photosynthesis happens. These organelles are called chloroplasts. These chloroplasts absorb light energy. When a plant takes in water through its roots and carbon dioxide with its leaves, it then uses that light energy to split those molecules apart. Once they are split apart, they can be reorganized as a molecule known as glucose. It's that glucose that the plant uses to grow more roots, leaves, fruits, and seeds. And in this process, there is a byproduct. A byproduct that we couldn't live without. Oxygen. So basically, if you think about it, the oxygen we breathe is just a plant fart. Plants can be organized into two main divisions vascular and non-vascular plants. Does it or does it not possess vascular tissue? We have vascular tissue in the form of arteries and veins. Plants have vascular tissue in the form of xylem and phloem. Non-vascular plants would be like your mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. Vascular plants then can be divided into another two groups, the seed-bearing or the spore-bearing plants. Spores are the structures associated with reproduction within the plants that don't produce seeds, plants like ferns, horsetails, and club mosses. The seed-bearing vascular plants can be characterized again into two specific groups. The gymnosperms, or your cone-bearing plants like conifer trees, pines, junipers, cycads, and ginkgo trees. And your angiosperms, which are all the flowering plants. We take angiosperms and we can divide them into two more divisions, and that is the monocots and dicots. When angiosperms germinate, monocots only produce one cotyledon, like grasses, sedges, and orchids. The other group of angiosperms is the dicots, the plants that germinate with two cotyledons. When you start your garden seeds in the spring, many of the plants that you plant will be dicots, 
like peppers, cucumbers, tomatoes, and so on. All of these kingdoms are fascinating in their own way, but most people's favorite kingdom is Animalia. All of the different animals around the world, including you and me, are within this kingdom. There are 35 phylums, or phyla, within the animal kingdom, but 10 of them are the most well-known and understood and contain roughly 90% of all known animal species. We can break animals into two major groups, either vertebrates, animals containing a backbone or a notochord, or the invertebrates, animals lacking that backbone or notochord. If we look at the largest of the two categories, the invertebrates, we will see a wide array of animals and around 95% of all animal species. Some of the phyla include the periphera, which are the sponges, like SpongeBob. Another phylum of invertebrates are the cnidarians, or cnidaria, which translates from the Greek word nidos, which means stinging nettle. This phylum is made up of five classes of jellyfish, anemones and corals, and hydras. Uh, no, not that one. The phylum platyhelminthes is the phylum of flatworms. These animals are the simplest of animals with a bilateral symmetry. This phylum includes the parasitic fluke worms and tapeworms. If there are flatworms, you can bet there are roundworms. And they are all in the phylum nematoda. These can be parasitic or free living species in our soils and waterways. While we are still talking about worms, let's talk about the most recognizable ones, the segmented worms, like the earthworm or leeches. These worms belong to the phylum Annelida and are more complicated than the round or flat worms. These guys can be beneficial or they can be parasitic. Either way, a lot of them make great fish bait. Phylum Mollusca, or the mollusk, is the second largest phylum of all animals on Earth. These soft-bodied animals are usually accompanied by a hard shell, but not always. Mollusca includes the snails, slugs, clams, mussels, oysters, and cephalopods like octopus and squid species. If SpongeBob was in the periphera phylum and Squidward was a mollusk, then what is Patrick? Well, Patrick, like other starfish, along with sea urchins, sea cucumbers, bristle stars, and sand dollars, are all echinoderms. No! This is Patrick! Phylum Echinodermata are all marine species and date clear back to the Cambrian period, 500 million years ago. If Mollusca is the second largest phylum of animals, what's the first? That would be the arthropods. Around 84% of all known species of animals are members of this phylum, phylum arthropoda. Arthropods are insects, arachnids, crustaceans, and the centipede and millipedes. All of the phyla that I've talked about so far are invertebrates. So that leaves the final phylum of the kingdom, Animalia, Chordata, or simply put, the vertebrates or organisms that have a notochord, the animals that everyone thinks about when they hear the word animal. But of all the known species of animals, only about 5% are vertebrates. The vertebrates can be characterized into five groups. You have the lobe-finned, bony, and cartilaginous fishes, the amphibians, Reptiles, birds, and mammals, which we are part of. Chordata also includes a few groups of animals that don't necessarily look like they belong. Organisms like the sea squirts and salps. And that is how all living organisms are classified. This system has changed over time and it may change again as we keep learning about our natural world. I will go more into detail about each one of these groups later on in this channel, so be sure to subscribe for those future videos. And if you enjoyed this video or if this helped, I'd really appreciate a thumbs up. Until next time, keep learning and keep wandering.